I kind of wish that I could speak from up here, because wouldn't that be cool? Like, you know, you've got to be... <clears throat> and you've got to lean in a very imposing sort of way when you're on one of these, but maybe not, maybe not today. Um, I told my pastor last week, he's from Oklahoma, and I told him I was, I was coming here. I said, I'm, I'm going to Birmingham. And he said, no, 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 no. <laughs> you're going to Birmingham. Ooh, this like literally nearly broke on me. That was scary. Uh, so I'm delighted to be here. It's my first time in Birmingham. Am I getting this right? Is this close? Okay. I'm married to a guy from Oklahoma, but his accent has sort of slid with the years, so he's no help to me at all. Y- y'all are going to be much more helpful to me with the accent. Um, so delighted to be here. I- I've got a question for you guys, though, anyone who is actually from here. I walked this morning to a Starbucks, and on my way I went past a cafe which said, don't forget your Jesus cake. <laughs> like, can anybody, what on earth? Is, is that a thing, or are they just actually crazy? It's like, okay, I, I have like photographic evidence, I'm not making this up. So if you remember anything from me this morning, I want you to remember this, do not forget your Jesus cake. Okay, <laughs> just don't, don't leave here without it. Tell me what it is. A Miami thing. They have Jesus cake in Miami, people. We need to get down there. Okay, okay. Um, So not last summer, but the summer before, I went for a long walk with a dear friend of mine. He's actually from Texas. And I always have fun with this particular friend. She's one of the few people with whom I will, like, laugh until I'm actually crying. You know, those sorts of friends. But it was an especially delightful walk because... She had walked through several years of just a bunch of hard things. In particular, she had a couple of really rough relationships, including a broken engagement. And and I'd walked alongside her in all of this. And then we strolled down the Charles River together that Thursday night. And my friend was giving me her updates. And everything in her life was just great. She was loving her job. She had this delightful boyfriend. She had really close friends. And I I came home that night and I said to my husband, how lovely it was to just hear from this particular friend that everything was going so well. That's Thursday night. On Sunday morning, I woke up to an email from my pastor saying that on Saturday night, my friend had been walking home from the the train station late. She'd been assaulted. A 16-year-old boy had ridden up to her on a bike, hit her over the head with a blunt instrument, and left her, snatched her bag, left her to bleed out on this sidewalk. I I honestly couldn't believe it. She was in the local hospital, she was unconscious, she'd probably lost one of her eyes, and it was unclear if she had brain damage. I went to the hospital as soon as I could that day, and she was still unconscious, I couldn't see her. I came back later that day, And her dad had flown up from Texas to be with her. And he is a a lovely Christian man. And he'd read my first book. And he knew that she and I were friends. And he said, I'm so glad you're here. Because when my daughter wakes up, you can tell her that God was actually protecting her last night. Because if she hadn't been on the phone to her boyfriend when she was assaulted, he wouldn't have been able to raise the alarm. And if somebody hadn't happened to walk down that dark alley a few minutes later and found her in a pool of blood, she may not have got to the hospital in time to save her life. I so admired this man's faith in that moment. But I thought to myself, when my friend comes round, I can't tell her that God was protecting her last night. Because if God had been protecting her, she wouldn't have been assaulted in the first place. If you, like me, believe in the sovereignty of God, if you, like me, believe that he is in fact in charge and in control of all things at all times, then you, like me, must reckon with the hard reality that sometimes God allows terrible things to happen to the people he loves. Please grab your Bible and turn to John chapter 11. 
I'm going to use this extremely small New Testament in Psalms. It was given to my grandpa by his grandmother in 1944. And the reason I'm using this is not just because it's literally pocket-sized, but also because what my grandfather needed in 1944 and what his grandmother needed when she first got this Bible, it says at the back, in 1918, was exactly the same thing that the young people for whom you are caring need today. They need to meet Jesus in, in his living word. So John, turn with me to John chapter 11. At the beginning of this chapter, John introduces us to a family, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And John wants us to know that Jesus loved this family. Mary was a very common name among first century Palestinian Jews. And so he identifies who this Mary was in verse two. It was that Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick. Luke's gospel tells another story about Mary and Martha. We know that Jesus loved this family. So when Mary and Martha's brother Lazarus got sick, they called for Jesus. In verse three, and listen to what they say specifically to him. Lord, the one you love is sick. Not Lord Lazarus is sick, not Lord our brother is sick. Lord, the one you love is sick. So what does Jesus do? When Jesus heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was. Now this is crazy. John emphasizes again, he says in verse five that Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. It doesn't make any sense. If it had said Jesus loved Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, so when they called, he came right away, that would make sense. If it said Jesus didn't really care about Mary, and Martha, and Lazarus, and he was busy with other stuff anyway, so when he got the memo that Lazarus was sick, he took his time, that would make sense. But John tells us that Jesus loved Mary, and Martha, and Lazarus, and so he didn't come. In fact, he deliberately waited until Lazarus was dead, and then he came. If you, like me, have been a Christian for some years, I'm willing to bet that there have been times in your life when you have called out to Jesus and it seemed like he hasn't come. Remember a few years ago, I was going through a, a period of just deep emotional pain. No, nobody had died, my exterior world was, was just fine, but I'd lost a, a, a relationship that was very important to me and, and it, it had really messed with me. I'm British, so I don't really cry. <laughs> but my husband, in the space of about a month, saw me cry more than he'd seen me cry in the previous 10 years that he'd known me. And one night, we'd put the kids to bed. I was sitting on the couch crying. He came and sat with me, and he did what a good Christian husband should do. He opened his Bible, and he started reading to me from Psalm 121. I lift my eyes up to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, maker of heaven and earth. I just cried more. I said to my husband, I feel like I am crying out to the Lord and he is not helping me. That is what Mary and Martha experienced that day. They probably knew Jesus can heal from a distance. He doesn't even need to be there. And when they called for him, he didn't come. But then, eventually, Jesus came. Let's pick up at verse 17. When Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the grave for four days. And then it's, it's just, it's painful. Look at at verse 18, Bethany wasn't even that far away from Jerusalem. He could have got there quickly if he'd wanted. 
And Martha runs out to Jesus and she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now, whatever you ask of God, he will do for you. Do you hear this woman's faith? Her brother is dead and she still thinks that Jesus can heal him. How does Jesus respond? He gives her a theological answer. Your brother will rise again. Now, many Jews at that time believed that there would be a resurrection of the faithful at the end of time. And Martha believes this too. She says, yes, Lord. I know that he will rise again at the resurrection on the last day. But you can almost hear her thinking, but what about now, Jesus? What about now? Why won't you help me now? And Jesus looks into the eyes of this grieving woman and he says, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me, even though he dies, will live. And whoever lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Martha thought that her main problem was that Lazarus was dead. She thought that her greatest need was for Jesus to raise her brother. But Jesus tells her in that moment, no. Your greatest need is me. I am the resurrection and the life. This is one of Jesus' famous I am statements in John's Gospel. All the others are spoken to groups. This one is spoken to one grieving woman. I am the resurrection and the life. It's, it's easy for me to think of Jesus honestly as a means to an end. We pray in the midst of our circumstances, hoping that Jesus will help us. We can go through Jesus to this, this better set of circumstances. But Jesus is not a means to an end. He is the end. He is the resurrection and the life. And notice that, how he puts the resurrection first. He doesn't just say, I am the life, though he is. I am the resurrection and the life. The dying comes first. Martha goes in and tells Mary that Jesus is here. And Mary comes out and repeats her sister's words, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother would not have died. And Jesus is deeply moved by this, and he says, take me to Lazarus' grave. And they go there together. And then we find, again, one of the most confusing and perplexing verses in the whole of the Bible. Jesus wept. Why is Jesus weeping? Some of the bystanders look at him weeping and they say, look how much he must have loved Lazarus. And others say, wait a minute. Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man, also have stopped this man from dying? Answer, yes. If Jesus had come when he was called, nobody would have been weeping because Lazarus would not have been dead. And yet, Jesus weeps with Mary and Martha. What does this tell us about how Jesus relates to us in our suffering? What does this tell us about the God who is sovereign over all things? It tells us that it is not that our suffering doesn't matter to God. Our suffering matters enough to bring tears to the eyes of the Son of God. He weeps with us in our pain. It's so easy, I think, for those of us who are not currently experiencing intense suffering 
to speak into the lives of those who are and to give them the right theological answers. And there's a place for that. But we must also not forget that Jesus weeps with those who are suffering. He holds those who are suffering in their pain. My, my little kids, they're, they're 11, 9, and 3, and it, I, it used to sort of perplex me that my little girls, um, the, the older ones, love me very much, they spend a, a bunch of time with me, but somehow when they're really hurting, they want their daddy. If daddy's there, he'll hold them, he'll take care of them, he'll put the band-aids on, he'll do what, what needs to be done. Jesus holds us in our pain. Jesus weeps with us when we're weeping, even though he knows the end of the story. He weeps with us. And in fact, there is an opportunity for us in the midst of suffering to cling on to Jesus more. I had a hard experience later this summer. I'd, um, been identified that I had some mysterious lumps that may or may not have been cancerous. And so I went to uh, have some biopsies done. And, and in, my, in my head, I don't know why I'd even thought this, but I'd sort of assumed that my husband would be able to come with me to have the biopsies, that he'd be able to sort of be in the room. And I was thinking to myself, if, if he's there, kind of holding my hand, it'll be okay. When we got to the office, they said, no, sorry, can't come in. And again, I'm not, I'm not a big crier, but I just, I just started crying. Um, and I, you know, I cried as they asked me all the, the questions that you always get asked when you're in any kind of doctor's office, and I cried as they, they got their instruments ready and as they, they did their stuff, because I had been counting on my husband being there with me. And then I thought, okay, Lord, Brian's not here, but you are. And I, I started sort of humming to myself, um, you know that song, um, Whom Shall I Fear? He goes, whom shall I fear? Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I fear? I just hummed that to myself as this was going on. And afterwards, the, the doctor said, you know, look, we'll get the biopsy results in a few days. 50-50 chance you have cancer. So, okay. Um, I spent a few days praying hard and, and talking with friends. And, and one friend said to me, you know, I, I, just, I just think God's not sort of finished with the, the work that he has for you here. And I said, I, don't, I know, but there's, there's no reason for us to believe that he doesn't want me to do that work while also having cancer. There's no promise to God's people that they will experience healing here and now, that they won't go through the hard things. It seems like, thankfully, at least for the time being, that I probably don't. But if I did, I would need to cling on to Jesus in the midst of that. And if we look back to John 11, Jesus weeping with us is not the end of the story. Do you remember he says, roll the stone away? And they say, but wait a minute, there's, there's going to be an odor at this point. You know, Jesus, you don't seem to understand. Lazarus is really, really dead. But Jesus says, roll the stone away. And then he cries out in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And John tells us the man who was dead came out. When I drive past cemeteries with my kids, I, I always remind them of this story. And I tell them that one day, if they have put their trust in Jesus, when they are, are, are dead and rotting in the ground, one day Jesus will come and he will say, Miranda, come out. Eliza, come out. Luke, come out. And at the end of the day, that is all that is going to matter. I asked my friend earlier this week if she was okay with me sharing her story with you guys, and she, she said that she was. F thankfully, even though she's lost the sight in, in one eye and is permanently wounded, she didn't have brain damage. Um, her, her delightful boyfriend 
proposed to her a, a few weeks after this incident, and now they're, they're married and, and, and building their life. But that is not the happy ending to her story. The happy ending is that she still trusts in Jesus because he is her resurrection and her life.